So now we have a grad student speaker uh, who is working in the theory group. Uh, is David Epstein your advisor? Yes. Okay. Yes. I've also worked with David, so it's characteristic of his work too. Okay, and so this is again changing gears. This is going very to be much. this is going to be very <laughs> theoretical. Not as scary as the title sounds, but okay. still will be very theoretical. And I also need to say that he recently won a best presentation award at a conference. So, yes. which is which is basically the reason why I selected him for this presentation. We were wondering why. <laughs> Everyone was kind of wondering why I got the email. I actually went through the yeah, who got the awards. Okay, so some technical difficulties. Unfortunately, um, this is going to be a quick talk anyway, so we're very much changing pace into theoretical um, problems. So there will be no um, half-implemented projects, there will be no full-implemented projects, there will be no implemented projects. So these are completely theoretical algorithms. Characteristic of the work of um, David Epstein and Michael Goodrich here, although he's not on this project. And how do I go to the next one? Probably spacebar? Uh, close enough. So one of the big subjects we work on here um, in the theory group is graph drawing, which is um, to consider graphical representations of graphs. You guys have seen adjacency matrices. You've seen adjacency lists. We want graphical representations. But we don't just want visualizations. We want um, unambiguous graphical representations. So we'll scroll that way. So um, our problem is to go in this direction. By unambiguous, I mean um, don't have vertices end up on an edge they don't belong on. Um, don't have two edges that are curved meeting at a common tangent. Um, we want completely unambiguous representations. Not always, but it's a good goal. Sometimes we do visualizations. So to give you a flavor of the type of questions uh, we're interested in, I have four drawings of a cube here. Um, I'd like you all to just take a second to look at them. Pick your favorite. They are all the cube. I guarantee you that. Um, and by show of hands, um, who likes this drawing? OK. More people like this one than the last time I did this talk. How many like this one? OK, you all hate Ben's. Um, how many like this one? It's kind of cool. And how many of you like the wrong drawing? OK. <laughs> so that's usually the one that gets all the votes for obvious reasons. But I want you to keep in mind, that's not a 3D drawing. It's a 2D drawing with crossings. Your brain says you want it to be 3D, but we're doing 2D drawing here. So um, why you might love or hate these drawings, and this is probably the most important slide um, of this talk to get a feel for what we do here um, in graph drawing. Okay, so we might hate this drawing because it has crossings. And we almost always agree crossings are bad when you don't have to have crossings. Other reasons you might hate this drawing is it has poor angular resolution. Angular resolution is asking how well are we using the full spacing around a vertex? Because when edges are close to each other, they tend to be harder to distinguish. So here, I'm only using 90 degrees around here for three edges. So it has bad angular resolution. Whereas this one has the best angular resolution. You know, I'm using more of the angle around it. Reasons you might hate this drawing is it has bends. Um, the more bends you have, I mean, in this case, it's easy because there's only one bend and they're in predictable symmetric locations. But as you have more bends, the drawings can be harder to follow edges you know, making them less useful. Um, this is, in a sense, my favorite drawing. Um, and the only real reason I can see to hate this drawing is it doesn't have uniform edge length. And as that gets more extreme, um, you can't print it on your screen. Imagine one edge being a centimeter and another edge being, I don't know, a thousand kilometers. That's hard to print on your screen and still be able to distinguish things. This is, if I'm just looking at it and saying, what is my favorite? This is my favorite. Um, but it's because it shows something of the cube that the others don't. And that's that there's a Hamiltonian cycle in the cube. It very clearly illustrates you can go through all the vertices in one path. And so that's cute, but I don't know if I'd call that a good visualization criteria. So the kind of things we care about are bends, crossings, 
angular resolution, <laughs> having the computer stay alive. Okay, <laughs> so I gotta talk less and tap more. Um, we can do that. <laughs> and um, um, so these are the kind of problems we care about. And let's see, this is more domain specific, not something we would typically care about. So we want to produce good, exact drawings. So it's sounding practical thus far. We'll turn it into theory. <coughs> so um, one style of drawing, which I've been interested in, because there are many styles, um, and the style that I've been interested in is so-called book embeddings. And this is where we are going to draw the graph on the pages of a book. We're going to place the spine on the spine of the book all the vertices, and then we're going to draw them on the pages. There are many applications. Well, first of all, if you can't see the 3D, this might help. It helps more when it happens instantly, but scrolling will work. So that's one of the pages. Also note that I always draw pages in two ways. They're topologically equivalent. This is just taking right here and opening it up. So we tend to interchange between the linear version and the circular version as um, our needs happen. That's the other page, and that's the third page. But um, three pages is ugly, unless we had you know, some nice 3D glasses. So for the purposes of visualization, uh, we don't tend to do that. Uh, oh, yes, what are we going to optimize? The only thing we can really optimize in these problems, because they can't move vertices, is crossings. I want to reduce the number of crossings. I only count crossings in the same page. Um, that contradicts that previous drawing, but I'm going to show you why that's a valid thing to do. It's because, well, we're only going to consider one page and two page when you can lay the book flat. For mathematical applications and some other engineering applications, it makes sense to consider higher page drawings. But if I'm just trying to visualize things for you, one page and two page. And um, an early application, very early application, is by Fari when he was studying number theory. And it was to use one page drawings. And it illustrates a cool feature. You can label the vertices right below them. So if you can get a good one page drawing, you can label it. That's a nice feature to have. Another place where these drawings are used is in um, RNA base pair prediction. This is a little bit of a, a fake application because you're not really allowed to rearrange these things when you're visualizing it. So I can't really make the drawing better. You know, it's an application of where they do two page drawings, but there's nothing for me as an algorithms designer to do on this problem. And this was the motivation. So the original motivation for why we were considering page drawings was to draw um, actually Twitter networks um, and um, disease transmission networks, which actually have a lot in common. Um, <laughs> so for whatever reason, you want to look at that. But the main thing they have in common is they tend to be very tree-like. So they tend to be tree-like with a few extra edges. In disease transmission networks, you have this part of the graph that has loops, and that's the reinfection region. So that's where the people are actively reinfecting um, each other. And then from that, you have the outward spread. That's where it's spreading and starting, to, you're stopping the infection. Um, and this is an HIV transmission um, network that um, these guys were studying. And we, and you notice this isn't a page drawing, but what we decided we wanted to do when we were looking at this problem is we wanted to draw the loopy part in the middle with the tree growing out from it. So the tree growing out from it, tree drawing algorithms, people know how to do. That's, there's a page just of tree drawing algorithms, and there's a couple hundred on there. So people know how to draw trees. Um, we figured a one-page drawing of the loopy part in the middle would be a reasonable way to draw that. And now the only optimization you can throw at it Crossing minimization. So that's what first led us to this problem. Um, it was actually another grad student here in sociology who first um, you know, got us thinking about drawing Twitter networks, and then it led to these other ones. So that was our application. And we solved it in a way that only a theoretician could by 
producing algorithms that won't run in this universe, but um, so crossing minimization. Find a permutation, find an assignment of edges to pages that minimizes the total number of crossings. That's our goal. And we're going to skip a couple things. So you have a feel for the types of results people get in these because we probably won't get to some of our results. The type of things people care about is, well, planarity, one page planarity, linear time, uh, and actual linear time. Because when we say planarity in general is linear time, those are linear time algorithms with giant massive constants on them. That's a real algorithm. You can code that. Um, minimization is NP hard. Most optimization problems in graph drawing are NP hard. So um, that's not going to be the end of the story for anything in graph drawing. Um, exact minimization, this one bugs me. The best I've seen that anyone knows how to do is try all permutations. Pick the best. That seems wrong. There should be some way to attack this by dynamic programming or something like that and get it to the n algorithm. Um, but several of us have tried, not just at this school, but at other schools, and nothing. You can approximate these to within a factor of log squared n, meaning you can get within log squared n times the minimum number of crossings, but that's unsatisfying because your approximations get worse as your problem size increases. And also, I have a feeling that these aren't practical algorithms because I've never seen anyone implement them. I have not tried either. Um, but I should note, heuristics tend to work. And that's what we used You know, when we are actually doing the crossing minimization for our disease networks. The story changes for two-page. Planarity is NP-complete. Can you draw it in two pages? NP-complete. Uh, minimization, of course, is then NP-hard, not shocking. Here, again, I don't know anything better than the brute force. I don't feel that should be true, but I don't know anything better than the brute force. Same approximation ratio, it does not keep going to higher page. One page and two page has the same approximation ratio. We lose it as we go three, four, and up. Heuristics don't work well in practice. There are a bunch of them. They're mostly based on genetic algorithms, and they're pretty cool heuristics, you know, how they work. But they don't tend to get you good drawings. They don't tend to minimize crosses. It's in people have examples where they keep doing bad. You know, they, people know how to get the minimum number of crossings, and the heuristics just bomb on them. So um, very open. And let's actually scroll down further since we don't need all these transitions. There we go. So um, the question now is just because everything is NP hard and graph drawing pretty much, what are we going to do? And there's two ways to attack NP hard problems pretty much, um, at least from a theoretical point of view. There is approximate, and there is let's restrict the problems we look at to examples people care about and prove we can solve them in those cases. The approach we've taken is primarily the second one, restrict the problem. And the approach we take is ask, what's making the problem hard? You know, are graphs with fewer crossings easier? Are graphs that are tree-like easier? That's what we want, because we want to draw tree-like graphs. Um, are social networks easier? Oftentimes, social networks have properties that make graph algorithms run better on them even hard things like coloring and problems of this nature. And so our goal is to show it's fixed parameter tractable. What that means is there exists some parameter, there exists some computable function. If it's not computable, um, ugliness happens. Um, and there's an exact algorithm which runs in some time where the constant depends on your parameter. So if your parameter is fixed, only the constant depends on your parameter, and the rest is polynomial. And we'd like C to be 1, 2, 3. You know, no more than Q. Um, it still counts if it's a million here, but um, you want it to be like 1, 2, or 3. Because your hope is to get exact algorithms. And so, yeah, the problem is um, let's blame the runtime on someone else, not on the size. Let's find some parameter to blame, and we're going to blame the runtime on that. 
and let me decide what to skip here. Some parameters we've considered are this almost tree parameter, which you can think of as just, you started with a tree, how many edges did you throw in? There's this biconnected component nonsense here, and that's just because if you know what a biconnected component is, basically it means there's redundant edges. You have to remove um, at least two vertices to split the network. Um, you can handle those separately, and so ignore that. How many extra edges? Um, tree width. Have any of you seen tree width? How about the faculty member in the room? Have you seen, you've seen tree width? No. Yeah, that's, that's what I expect. So this is also the typical response when I give this talk and mention tree width, because it's a parameter only a theoretician could love. Um, maybe also an AI theoretician. I believe um, um, uh, Dector here also works um, with tree width uh, type algorithms. Even computing this parameter itself is NP hard. So, um, but it measures large scale tree structure. Um, originally, my description of it was a parameter not easily described in one line. So, um, yeah, <laughs> the natural parameter, number of crossings. These are, you've probably seen this before in one of your classes, output sensitive algorithms. That's what we're talking about here. If I parameterize by the number of crossing, I'm saying, well, you only have to pay for what you find, in a sense. And so that's always what we desire. Not possible for two page, because it would imply polynomial uh, time for planarity. Zero crossings, plug zero into the parameter, get a polynomial time algorithm. Oh, not possible if p does not equal np. Um, and I think we'll probably stop at methods, because that gives you enough of a flavor of how this works. The main method that you always try first is you take your big input and you make it smaller. That's a good approach if your algorithms are dependent on input size. Make it smaller. So figure out some way to reduce the size of your input to being smaller than a function of your parameter, but maintaining the same answer. In a theoretical sense, this will always work in that um, if a problem is fixed parameter tractable, there is an approach by kernelization. But it might be dumb. You know, it might be some trivial type of uh, thing. So not always how you approach it, but when it works, it's the easiest approach. Um, make it smaller, use the exact algorithm. So your goal here to get practical algorithms, algorithms that will actually run um, in this universe is Find the smallest kernel you can possibly find and get the best exact algorithms. You know, get those not n factorial, but single exponential. <coughs> and hopefully even better than 2 to the n, hopefully like 1.5 to the n. You know, some really good exact algorithms. The other approach which we've used, there's many approaches to FPT, but the other approach that I've had a lot of luck with is logical expressibility. Um, this never can yield practical algorithms, almost by definition, because the dependencies are usually towers of twos, so um, that ain't going to work. But if you can describe the problem using second order logic, a specific fragment, you hit it with this massive hammer, and it just says, there's an algorithm. It is constructive. In a sense, um, but I mean, as in, it's not like some math, it exists. They show you how to build it, but it's so convoluted and so recursive that it just can't yield practical algorithms right now. There are some people at the University of Bordeaux that are working on restricting the language so that um, not only is it runnable on a computer, but it's automated. The way you code it is by feeding it the formula and then it writes the program. Um, but I think we're a ways off before, I mean, they have a few small cases where it's working, but I think we're a ways off from that being totally working. And the other big limitation here is um, it's not natural for computer scientists to describe their problems in second order logic. So I think a really, what we really need here is a um, monadic second order logic for the working computer scientists. 
We need a collection of tools, ingredients, that you could build these solutions from that is more understandable. This is a pain. I mean, just an absolute pain to write things in logic when you're used to coding in structured ways. But, yeah. So, um, I don't know, just to skip, um, we've had some luck with it. Our algorithms um, still aren't small enough to run. There's still much open work in making the kernel smaller, making the exact algorithm smaller. Um, these constants are really what are killing us. If we just had a K factorial, um, I could use it in a lot of applications, but once you throw that five on the parameter, I can't use it. It's not um, useful to me at this point. Um, and these ones, we, well, we knew from the outset that these weren't gonna be useful, but we did get that elusive natural parameter for one pitch. So we did get crossing number, and so that was cool. But um, yeah, so um, just to say there are many open problems to, still here. Faster exact exponential algorithms is the main one. That would make get us towards um, actually practical algorithms. Um, close the approximation gap. Either prove the heuristics actually work well, or find new algorithms that have provable guarantees. Um, practical FPT algorithms. And um, well, if we've given up on practical, let's see how much we can push the logical to other problems, because it has not been widely used to many problems. Um, so uh, yeah, so very different pace from the other talks. But yes, we are the mathematicians here. We go more mathematical than this, in case you were worried that this isn't technical enough. So. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thanks.